Okay. All right. Uh, so next we have up Brendan O'Brien, who is not on the schedule. <laughs> and I assume you're not the record producer who produced like no, Pearl gems, like Versus Soundgarden and stuff. No, that guy's way cooler than me. <laughs> he is. He is way cool. I'll give you that. <laughs> Uh, uh, Brendan was a uh, on deck replacement uh, as Jason got sick. So Brendan's going to give us a wonderful and uh, well prepared presentation. <laughs> uh, and an interesting fact about Brendan O'Brien is that he can hold a pop can between his shoulder blades. I can. I'll show you later. And he will demonstrate it so for everybody that. during the break. After this. I do. That'd be, that'd be such an awesome talk. I have, I, I'm genetically flawed. It's really weird. Um, yeah. So I think we, it's going to take a minute for you to get Give me your... one second. I'm new. So let's, so should we do a quick book giveaway? Uh, no, tell some jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I heard Batman was here. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> Matt, Matthew Campbell. Here we go. Matthew uh, Campbell. This we need to get, are you mic'd up? Okay, before we start, awesome. uh, we I'm replacing this guy, Jay Moron. I wanted to show him out really <laughs> quick. He writes this package, which is Postgres. You should definitely check it out if you need Postgres. It's, it does everything. It's so good. It's so awesome. Like he's and his blog. Yeah, you know, I really want to see his talk. You should, you're, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, he'll he'll be at NYC Golang. He's awesome. I I am on the other hand, Kyle and I were uh, we should have talked before. That's we're coming from the same room. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that means we're gonna be friends. It's good. Uh, so I this is a very poorly named asinine talk. It's more of a rant as well. Uh, this is not going to teach you a lick of go. I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, there are people here who like are better at that. So ask them. Uh, instead, I'm Brendan. I'm, uh, I'm the technical side of a two-person startup. Yes, this exists. Yes, I'm one of them. Um, and this is a very quick talk uh, because I am wildly into Go for some weird reasons. Um, and I really want to talk about it. I want to convince you about why I'm into Go for some weird reasons. And this talk, like me, is very weird. Uh, yeah, no code. That is the only code in this talk, package main. Uh, because this is only really, and it's important because I'm going to take a giant dump on an entire section of computer science here. Um, and so it's important to know that this is in context. Um, the context that we're dealing with here is people who write applications aimed at solving problems. Usually, I mean, in my case, I'm dealing with users, real people who use real software. Um, and even more specifically, uh, this only really works when the problem is like an open domain problem. Something where you're writing code, putting it out into the real world, Finding out if it fits the thing you're trying to get it to do, refining it, coming back, right? And so, yeah. So I have a uh, fine arts background. I came at code because I was an art director who was really tired of you guys getting my mock-ups wrong. And so I was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to learn uh, some CSS, then some HTML, and some PHP, and then some JS, and some Node, and then. Yeah, yeah, and then you find out that no, just like on the server side, yeah, static typing is your friend, and uh, yeah. So I ended up coming at Go when I saw Rob Pike, who I didn't know at the time, on YouTube say uh, the phrase, you don't have to juggle inheritance trees. And for me, that was like this lightning rod moment of I have had a problem with uh, Objective-C, which I'd spent a long time in, uh, and I, this language irks me, this language changes the way that I think, and I don't like the way that it's changing the way I think. And so I spend a lot of time with this question. What perspective do our tools ask us to take on a problem? Weird question, right? But it's real. Like, you're, we, the reason we have all these massive holy wars about different languages is because they suggest things to us and they ask us to approach and interpret uh, questions in different ways and problems in different ways. And the nice thing about tools and the reason that you have such vehement argument in this field is because it's really easy to change tools. I know it's hard to change a language, and obviously it's really hard to move a code base, but in your thinking and in the way that you think, you can learn new stuff. You just go to like learngo.org and you like kind of hang out and it's great, and it's like you learn really fast. And so to make this point, uh, we're gonna again go into, I, I told you this talk was weird. Uh, we're gonna talk about architecture, but not the kind you redo every six months, uh, the kind that, oh, that slide looks awful. That's a picture of buildings. Um, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about ar architectural history of all things um, very quickly. And I promise you, this is 
That may, might not be worth your time, but yeah, you're here. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so why not? Follow me. So let's go back in time. Let's go back in time to 1890. Uh, and things are really, really changing in the history of the world. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing and going nowhere, and it's quite obvious. And there's a group of people that are really starting to steer the world, and it's largely architects and designers. They're the sort of cultural kingpins of the time. They enjoy a massive amount of influence. Um, the first steel frame building is built in Chicago. This is a huge moment because this is when people realize, like, whoa, we can make stuff out of steel, and it can be huge. Like, we can make the biggest buildings. They actually halted construction of this building halfway through because it's a third the weight of a stone building. And everyone was like, this thing is not going to stand up. This is terrifying. And so they like went in like, OK, is this going to be OK? And then finally, you know, people start to move in. And they realize it's OK. And as that's happening, this, this change in technology uh, creates the most massive change in aesthetics and cultural ideologies you see like in the built world in, in history. Architecture goes from looking like this, which is sort of a neo-Gothic revival style, to this. This is Villa Savoy from La Corbusier. This guy's name is The Crow. Like, you know, Madonna, The Crow. This guy has like the most baller name. This guy, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this is the best time in architecture. You go talk to an architect and like, oh, international style, and they're like, oh, they're like really sort of jealous that they weren't alive at that era. Um, and so these guys start thinking really big because they have tools to build really big stuff. And so something changes, and I'm gonna, I was talking with Alex earlier, he said you should never put on a, a slide that you're going to like say the same words, and I realized I've done this like nine times. Uh, but the central image of a new architecture was not of a single building. It was a utopian town plan, and the planners of the time saw their paper cities with the detachment granted to possessors of the bird's eye view, very high up, very abstract, and thus nearer to God. And so you see this like pattern arising, and if you're wondering like how big are you talking, this is Le Corbusier's vision for Paris. Yeah, that's Paris. I'm not kidding. Like, he wanted to put, like, millions of people into these identical towers. And, he, and these guys are thinking, like, massive, 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 massive scale. And they're, like, millions of people. Um, you, know, you know, we know massive, right? But we'll get to that. Um, so they're, they're thinking really on a huge, huge scale. And their, their projects have some weird things in common. Uh, they, there's an alarming obsession with social hygiene. In the future, instead of lurking on streets and squares and alleys, the human beetle would be made to live in tower blocks to commute by, commute by monorail and, or moving pavement and scuttle about between allocated green space between skyscrapers and, in general, do one thing at one time in one specified place, which is according to the coming rationalization of all human life. Okay, if this doesn't sound, like, awful to you, I don't, like... This is bad. These are people, like, telling you how to live your life, and I'm not really into that. So, they messed up. They really, really, really messed up with their thinking. They went too big, and they <laughs> ended up with this. This is one of their people. And Philip Johnson said, we were thoroughly of the opinion that if you had good architecture, the lives of people would be improved, that architecture would improve people, and people would improve architecture, until so perfectibility would descend upon us like the Holy Ghost, <laughs> and we would be happy forever after. This didn't prove to be the case. <laughs> you think I'm joking. This is Buckminster Fuller's plan for San Francisco. <laughs> he wanted to put 100,000 people minimum in a floating tetrahedron in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. The US Navy came within three years of building this thing. I'm not kidding. This was a really weird time in the world. And it's because people really believed they had, they had this new stuff, and they thought that they could solve massive problems with it. So uh, yeah, programming, right, programming talk. Like I said, we should have yeah. met up. This is good. <laughs> so those who don't learn their history, Peter Thiel very recently came up with this thing, <laughs> right? This is 2015, and he wants everybody to live on an ocean and float away because he hates the government. So like, if you think this isn't history repeating itself, uh, I can spend more time and prove that to you. But there is a massive temptation with the old tools, with the style of the international architecture, they got this new stuff, they got their hands on new stuff, and they were really in a central position in their time in society to make big decisions. If any of this doesn't sound a little bit like what we do today, I, I can't make that connection more clear. And I think that there is a very dangerous uh, symptom that shows up, particularly in this style of thinking. And 
I call it God mode architecture, um, which is, <laughs> I, and I think God mode architecture is really bad. And I think that our tools uh, can encourage this or discourage this. And yes, this will be about Go because I think Go has a lot of nothing to say about this. And I think that that's very exciting. Um, I think the problem with God mode architecture is that it asks you to take a reductionist perspective on problems. It asks you to look at an issue like a person and say like, oh yeah, I can just sort of like crunch them down, give them a word, I don't know, user, and just like approach them all the same and put them into a box. And it asks you to reduce something that is very complex to something that is very static and immobile. And I think that that's an issue. And so like, what does this look like in code? And I think that this, you know, with because we can't get into this, this is such a philosophical talk, I'm not going to do specific code examples of this, but like from my objective C days, you know, you think about the shape of an object-oriented program, and what's the first thing you do with an object-oriented program is you subclass, in my case, NS object, and you're like, oh, and, and you think about how that feels, it's like, I, creator of the universe, right? Like, you think about what NS object is and how it's explained to you in computer science, it's this thing that's like, you know, it could be anything. It could be all of the things. It could be none of the things. It could have no methods. It could have 150 methods. And, and, and so like, you're like, okay. And, and this is a really heavy structure, as it turns out. And this was, you know, invented for some very specific reasons. But, you know, we come back to this question initially. What perspective does this ask you to take? I think it's kind of like this. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm not wildly into it, clearly. Uh, you know, so why does this even exist? And why does this exist in the context, as we said before, of solving sort of squishy problems? It's because programming is hard. Like, and I know this is like kind of basic, you know, you're here, but programming is really, really hard. And this whole thing was invented. You know, the reason we did this is because you have to take a problem and break it down into its component parts. This is obvious to you guys, but this isn't to most people. You know, why did we come up with this structure in the first place? It's to manage complexity. The problem is the weight of that is so high, and it really, I think it has a deep impact on your thinking, and it forces a style of thinking on you. It forces a perspective on the software that you write. And heaven forbid that the definition of the problem change underneath this massive floating tetrahedron, you know. <laughs> so, we're at a Go conference, I should probably talk about some Go. Um, and the big question is like, what is the shape of a Go program? And like we could use the sweet tools that Alex talked about, you know, we could pop up in Go Oracle and check out that like sweet, like, you know, this thing calls to this thing and these are like blam, blam, blam. But the real answer is, you know, who cares? Like they're not, who cares about the shape of a Go program? And you'll find this if you're new to Go, if, once you get into it, once the code smell goes away, once you find, like, on my third refactor, when I finally got rid of all these ridiculous packages that I defined for myself, and, like, you know, really got to the meat of it, it's just, like, nothing there. And so, like, what perspective does Go ask you to take? Well, when there's no structure there, it isn't. It doesn't. Go doesn't force you to think about a problem in a specific way when you're using it to write applications. It gives you no perspective on a problem. And to me, that's so incredibly exciting. Like that, when I first got into this language, I had three major feelings and they were all negative and they were all awesome. So I finally, when I finally, like after two, literally two years of writing Go, I sort of like finally wrote the program that I knew felt idiomatic and you know, the software was doing what it was want. I pulled Martini out, um, you know, and, and not to be, not to poop on Martini, it was great at the time. Um, but I had three feelings, you know, first one was, that's it. You know, like when it's done, you look at a Go program, it's like, uh, what? You know, it's just a bunch of functions, it's just a bunch of files. Like, where's my like magic, you know, framework that makes, takes all of my async functions and returns promises or like whatever, and it's done. And the next thing, next feeling I have every time I finish programs, I feel really stupid. <laughs> like, I feel like incredibly dumb when I'm writing Go, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. And the third feeling I have is I'm bored, which Kyle has already handled the boredom side. Um, but yeah, like Go kind of gets out of your way. It's a language that uh, I think Go is much more defined by what it doesn't do for you than what it does. And I think that that shows up in these three things. I think these three feelings that are normally bad for you as a programmer are actually incredibly good. And what they are are the sound of a giant doom pyramid of like structure leaving your brain. And I think that's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> like, for me, I'm like, yes, let's do more. And then, you know, and I, I but. What I do with that time is, is important to me because I'm one of two people at a startup, so I don't have a ton of time. 
programming is hard. Solving a real problem in the real world is so much harder. And like getting something, building something that somebody wants, not building, you know, I don't know, not building, say, Yelp for people. I don't know if anybody has seen that recently. Like, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be a great world if us, you know, programmers looked at people asking us to like, build Yelp for people, and we're just like, no, like, I don't, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Not with my time, and I don't want that to exist because I'm an intelligent human. With me. Oh, so, so I gotta fulfill the promise of the first thing, and I'm gonna try and keep this quick. But how does Go make me better at my job? Well, you're better at your job if you better understand the problem, and if you don't have to carry all that baggage of an inheritance tree along with you, I think you have way more time to engage with people. It gives you back mental overhead. I'm gonna skip all this crap. Uh, it allows you to make better compromises. Programming is still hard. And, and Go doesn't call you about that, you know. I always have this feeling of like that gopher like staring back at me like, dude, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, I don't know, it's great. I love Go so much because it's so mean to me. It's like this <laughs> incredible relationship. But the biggest thing that I think as a community, as a set of people who I believe see the light about this language and what this language has to offer, I think this is the biggest thing it gives us. It gives us back time to play really nicely with non-technical people and really to like engage with real issues. And I think you're seeing that in Kyle's talk and in my talk, I think people that are coming to this program, to this language, yes, you're showing up for concurrency and you're showing up for this, but like it's the white space in Go. It's the, it's the stuff that doesn't make you do and it's the stuff that doesn't tell you to do that lets you just get the code to be boring, focus on this thing that's hard. And if you are in this room and if you're an engineer and you know how to write code, you're an incredibly smart person. I'm here to like, you know, clap for you, it's great. Because I really feel like you're, you're capable of wonderful things and you should use your brain to do as many of those wonderful things as possible. And I think the world will thank you for it. And that's it. I'm not gonna take questions because I mean, there's no time. Well, thank you very much, that was awesome. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs>